Greetings, and welcome to the corner, that is, TC's Gaming Corner. This is going to be the second video of my tutorial series on the GMT Air Combat game Red Storm. My focus is teaching new or prospective players the basics of this game. Now, Red Storm has an intimidating 60-page rulebook, and I hope to help players get through that rulebook. In my first video, I taught the basics of air unit movement and activations. In this video, I will teach you about aircraft detection and air combat. Note that the Red Storm game also features solitaire rules that are only applicable in dedicated and designed solitaire modules. I'm not going to get into the solitaire specific rules, but instead focus on the basic rule set of head-to-head -head play. First, let's talk detection. Here you see two flights of aircraft in four different states of detection, undetection, and identification. At the top you see undetected generic flights. Undetected, there's a question mark in the middle, not a suit as in these two. Generic flights, if they're the enemy flights, you don't know what type of aircraft are flying in them. Next you see detected generic flights. Your integrated air defense system has detected them, knows where they are. You can fire on them if you have SAMs or aircraft in range, but you don't know what type of aircraft they are. Next you have identified and detected aircraft. Here you have F-104, West German F-104 aircraft. Over here you have Soviet MiG-23s and they're detected which means you can attack them. And then finally at the bottom you have previously identified so you still see the call sign for each flight but currently undetected flights. So again they can't be detected they can't be attacked when they're undetected. Finally, each side can have a certain number of dummy flights as indicated in the scenario rules. Dummy flights are always undetected and they exist to confuse the enemy player. They are on the board until they are detected or visually identified and then removed from the board. They can enter the map at the start of the game or they can enter the map or start on the map per the scenario rules for other aircraft. They can also be generated in the admin phase in the same hex and altitude band as another undetected flight. So for instance, in the admin phase, you could generate flight 105 in the same altitude band and location is 101. You can even change which one is the generic, the dummy flight on your record keeping by saying, hey, now 105 is my actual flight, 101 is the generic flight, is the dummy flight. Again, if 105 is the dummy flight, he becomes detected, he is removed from the map. Now that you know the different detection statuses, let's talk about how you actually detect those flights. There are four ways to detect enemy flights. The first is a regular detection attempt for every single undetected flight on the map. It doesn't matter where they are, what they're doing, how high or low they are, every single undetected flight gets one detection attempt. Next, you have visual detection. The third way is an aircraft radar search. And the fourth way would be an early warning radar search. We'll start with regular detection. The scenario will tell you the detection level, which goes from A, the best, to F the worst. You roll a 2d10 and if your roll equals or exceeds the number on the detection level you've detected the flight. Very simple. There are a few modifiers such as if the enemy flights are on the deck, on the deck in rough terrain, or a couple other modifiers. Very simple. If you roll the 2d10, a 16 would detect him. So I would flip him over and he is now detected. The next way is a visual detection. Visual detection is only within four hexes. So right here we have a range of three. So he, so this F-16 could attempt to detect this undetected Warsaw Pact flight. Um, you also have to have a line of sight. There aren't many things in the game that can block line of sight, but if they're on different altitude levels and there's a cloud deck between them, that can block line of sight. Again, all you do is roll 2d10. You check the visual column on the detection table. It takes a 12 or less. You check the visual modifiers down here. So target three or four hexes away 
is a minus 2. Or a different altitude band, haze or mist, nighttime. Um, and that's all it takes. 2D10, if you equal or exceed it, you've detected them. Radar search. There are two types of radar searches. One is aircraft radar search. The aircraft data card or data sheet will tell you what its range is for air search radars. I'll tell you the F-4 has a range of, I believe, 14. So this is within range. Each of your flights can attempt to detect one enemy flight that is within range of its radar. Again, all you do is you check the detection table. You see there's a column here by aircraft type. So this is the F-4 column right here. You check the aircraft radar searches modifiers. You roll 2d10 and if you ex equal or exceed that number you've detected them. And finally EWR is, the, is very similar but EWR can attempt to detect every single undetected enemy aircraft within its range. What is its range? Well, its range is 20 hexes for aircraft generally, except 10 hexes for aircraft on the deck. So these two trailing uh, flights are outside, they're on the deck, and they're outside of the 10 hexes, so this EWR would not roll for those two. Again, roll 2d10. If it exceeds the number, you have detected it. That is all there is for detection. Next I will show you how to lose detection and that takes place in a different phase of the round. Once detected, how do you lose detection? There are a couple of ways to automatically lose detection. The first way is during the movement phase. If two flights engage in air-to-air -air combat, at the conclusion of the combat, they become undetected. How else can you do it? Well, during the track phase, all NATO flights on the deck in rough terrain become undetected. All flights on the deck adjacent to or in a mountain hex become undetected. So here you have NATO flight 107 in the rough becomes undetected. Delta Delta Warsaw Pact flight adjacent to a mountain hex on the deck, it becomes undetected. Warsaw Pact Flight Charlie Charlie on the deck in rough but not adjacent to a mountain hex does not become undetected. Then the last way to become undetected is the Klaus Woodsian way, the friction of war, the randomness. Each player rolls 2d10 and consults the track table over here and all flights with that suit unbracketed become undetected this phase. So if you rolled a 4 on the table, all hearts flights would become undetected. If the suit is bracketed, all flights on the deck with that suit, any flight at low on its side of the front, and any flights in a chaff corridor. So, for instance, if we rolled the bracketed spades, the 9 here, this one would not become undetected because it's not on the deck. But Delta Delta is on the deck, so we would flip it to undetected, notwithstanding the mountain hex. So even if he was there, if we rolled the 9 all on the deck, spades become undetected. And each side rolls separately, so there's a different roll for the NATO side than the Warsaw Pact side. We've learned detection, now let's learn how to shoot them down. The rest of this tutorial will be about air-to-air -air combat. And tighten your straps because this can be an involved and confusing part of the game. But the payoff is high once you understand the steps and get through your first few air combats. There are two types of air combat, beyond visual range or BVR combat and standard air-to-air -air combat. The steps are similar for each with one key distinction. In BVR combat, only the moving side gets to attack. In standard air-to-air -air combat, both sides get to roll and make attacks. The steps in both are engagement. Do you actually get to attack? 
maneuver, determining the number of shots you get. Shot resolution, roll to see if the shots hit for damage or shoot downs. Damage allocation, which aircraft in the flight got hit. Depletion, did you run out of that weapon type? Now you don't track individual weapon usage, but you do roll for complete depletion, which means you are out of that type of weapon. Next is morale. If shots occurred, do the flights break? Does their morale or aggression go down? After the standard air to air combat, do you where do you scatter into an adjacent hex? You add markers, you lose detection in sta after standard air to air combat, you check for bailout for any shot down aircraft, and finally after standard air to air combat, you mark off fuel usage. Yes, that is a lot of steps. But all you have to do is follow the procedures, consult the tables, roll the dice, apply the modifiers, and you're done. It is a lot of steps, but they are logical and sequential. And one of the keys to mastering the game is understanding and applying the modifiers to maximize your chances of success in air-to-air -air combat. And all these modifiers are based on real-world situations and tactics. But before I dive into the detailed steps for air combat, let's talk about one more thing aggression. Every flight has an aggression level. The scenario will tell you the experience level of the pilots from ace to trained. That is the trained pilots. It's a euphemism for being able to take off and land but that's about it. Based on the experience or training level of your pilots you roll on a table to determine their aggression from plus two to minus two with the positives being better. The, their aggression is a key factor in the battle and affects their willingness and ability to engage other flights, their ability to take shots, and their morale, or their willingness to keep fighting after an engagement. The rules say that you roll for aggression when you are setting up the scenario, but an optional rule, one that I always play with, allows you to wait until a flight attempts to engage or check morale before you roll for aggression. That is, you don't know how aggressive your flights are before they engage in combat. Now back to combat. Let's talk BVR or Beyond Visual Range Combat first, as it is slightly simpler. BVR combat is when flights attempt to attack enemy flights that they cannot see, but can only detect with their electronic sensors, generally long-range radar-guided attacks, but there are a few exceptions. Aircraft that are BVR capable, and most aren't, need to be within the weapon's BVR range of an enemy flight before they can attack. And note that BVR ranges depending on the arc of the defending flight, that is the flight that it is attacking. Think of it this way, your effective BVR range is much longer if you are in front of the enemy flight because you are both closing on each other at hundreds, maybe even over a thousand knots. Rear BVR shots have a much shorter range because the missile has to catch up to its target. Now let's look at this M MiG-23 MLA Flogger G. Here you see, look on the right side, RHM, that's the radar homing missile. If you look on the second row, the bracketed 6, 3, and 1 are its combat ranges. 6 from the front, 3 from the beam, or 1 from the side. Or here we go in this example, 6 from the front, 3 from the beam, or only 1, I may have said the side, only one from the rear. So if this flight was here, he would not have range for a BVR shot. Now what are the steps to taking these flights? Well first, the prerequisites. So to take a BVR shot, the attacking aircraft has to be the activated and moving flight. So here we have Kazakov. If he is activated and moving, he could possibly take a BVR shot. The target has to be detected and in range. So we just went over detection. This would be in range, but not detected. If he's detected, you may be able to take the shot. And the rules of engagement have to permit it. Generally speaking, the rules of engagement prevent a BVR shot if there are friendly aircraft near the target. For BVR ROE, the rules of engagement have to permit it. Generally speaking, the rules of engagement prevent a BVR shot if there are friendly aircraft near the target. For BVR ROE, or rules of engagement, you cannot attack an enemy flight if there are friendly aircraft within three hexes of the target. 
So, if Kazakov wanted to attack 201, he could not, because Raskova is within three hexes of him. However, in the rare cases in which you are attacking a BVR shot from the defender's rear arc, such as this shot, you cannot fire if they're a friendly aircraft within one hex. So this would be a legal shot. This would not be due to the ROE. Think of it this way. If there are friendly aircraft near an enemy flight, the pilots cannot be sure that they are locked on to the enemy flight, and thus they will not engage. The next prerequisite is that the enemy flight has to be in the forward arc of the attacking flight. So, if 201 was over here, that is not in the forward arc, and you cannot take a BVR shot. And finally, flights that are disordered, aborted, or perform SAM avoidance or anti-radar tactics this turn cannot attack. So let's walk through the BVR steps. Here they are over here. First engagement. In BVR, this is only for the attacker. After moving at least one hex or changing altitude in a movement phase, the attacker declares a BVR attempt and rolls on this table applying th only these two modifiers. You need a 9 or higher on 2d10. And note finally that F15s automatically succeed in BVR attempts. Now if the engagement fails, here we go. Now if the engagement fails, you can attempt a BVR shot again after moving one hex or changing altitude. So. If you attempted this shot and you rolled 2d10 and you failed, this succeeded but let's pretend we failed, and you fail, you can move another space and attempt a BVR shot. If you fail again, you can take another one as long as you have movement points. Next is the maneuver phase where you determine how many shots you take by cross-referencing your modified roll with the number of aircraft in the flight. Note that most Warsaw Pact attacking aircraft apply Soviet Doctrine, which limits the number of attacks they get. Soviet Doctrine doesn't apply to MiG-29 or Sukhoi-27 flights, and only applies to the attacker. For BVR maneuver, you apply only these modifiers below, roll 2d10, and check on this maneuver table to determine how many shots, if any, you get to take. Now for shot resolution. For each shot, roll 2d10, modify it by the combat value of the selected weapon, and here on the MiG-23, you see that the radar homing on the bottom, the R-24, has a combat modifier of plus zero. Now for shot resolution. For each shot, roll 2d10, apply it to the combat value of the selected weapon, and determine what damage, if any, each shot causes. Depletion. Did you run out of the weapon? Roll 1d10, subtract 1 for each of the shot you took above, and if it is less than or equal to the depletion number of that weapon, you're a Winchester on that type of weapon and cannot use it again. If you hit, who did you hit? Roll 1d10 for each hit and consult this table to determine which aircraft you hit. Know that it is possible, even likely, that you could hit the same aircraft multiple times. The results of each shot are either damaged, crippled, or shot down. Then you roll for morale. If you take any shots, the defender has to roll on this table to find out if they break, abort, or very often lose an aggression value. Additionally, aircraft carrying bomb loads may have to take a jettison check where every aircraft rolls to see if they jettison all of their ordnance. Finally, if any aircraft were shot down, roll 1d10 for each crewman some aircraft have more than one. On a five or higher, the crewman successfully bails out, so you place a parachute marker. Now that's it for BVR combat, so let's roll into a couple examples. Here we have a flight of four MiG-29s attacking a flight of detected but unidentified NATO jets. The Defender is not only detected, but it's in the forward arc of the MiG. However, it is not within range which is 4 from the beam for a MiG-29 firing the R-24. 
radar guided missiles. But the MiG-29 is activated, so it will move and then attack. So there's one, range of five. Two, we are within range of four. Once within range, we roll for engagement. There's a minus one modifier because there's a difference in the altitude bands, medium and high. Plus a modifier for the MiG's aggression value, which we'll say in this case is plus one. So let's say we roll a seven on the first roll, which is a miss even without the modifier for a difference in the altitude band and regardless of the aggression value of the MiG. But the MiG still has movement points to spend, so we climb one level. spinning a movement point. We roll this time without the minus one modifier and let's say we got a 12 which is a successful engagement. So now we consult the maneuver table applying the BVR modifiers we would have a minus one for firing from the beam, a plus one due to the aggression value of the MiG-29 for a net modifier of zero. Let's say we roll a 14 we cross-reference the 14 under the BVR column with four aircraft and we get two shots. Next is shot resolution. The only modifier for shot resolution is the weapons modifier, which is a plus one for the R27s in BVR combat. So let's say we roll a 7 and a 15, which is modified to an 8 for no effect and a 16 for a shoot down. Depletion is next. The R27 has a depletion number of 6, so we roll a D10, subtract 1 since we took 2 shots, because you modify by an additional minus 1 for each shot you take above 1. We roll the 5, that's depleted, so we update our aircraft flight data sheet to show that we are out of radar homing missiles on this flight, on Antonov's MiG-29. Damage allocation is next. This is a flight of 4 NATO aircraft. So we roll in the 4 column and we have shot down one NATO aircraft. Let's say we roll the 0, which means we shoot down number 4. The NATO flight next rolls for morale, modifying by minus 1 for one aircraft shot down and any additional modifiers due to its aggression value. But let's say it's just 0 in this case. We look under the BVR combat column. Let's say we roll a 12. Mod which is modified to 11 because one aircraft was shot down. A modified 11 means we reduce its aggression value by 1, marking that on the data sheet. We conduct a jettison check for each aircraft if it has ground ordnance, and we would then jettison that ordnance on a 1 through 6 for each individual aircraft. Now if we rolled a little lower and we got it disordered, we would place this, this disordered marker on the NATO aircraft, but fortunately for NATO, we didn't roll that. Next, we place a BVR avoid marker. I did not mention this earlier, but anytime you take shots in BVR combat, you place a BVR avoid marker on the target. When the target activates next, it has to spend its first movement point to remove this BVR avoid marker. And finally, we roll for bailout. Since one aircraft was shot down, and we'll just say it was a one crewman aircraft, we roll a 1D10, which succeeds on a five or more. And if the pilot bails out, we place a parachute marker over there. And that's it for BVR combat. Finally, in this episode, we're gonna talk about standard air-to-air -air combat. And I'm gonna start out by highlighting what is different. First off, unlike BVR combat, both flights roll for engagement. Both flights also get to take shots at each other. And most importantly, you can only attempt to engage you if you are within one hex and at the same altitude or one higher of the defender. The defender has to be in your forward arc unless you are in the same hex. Also very important to note that you can attempt BVR combat and standard air-to-air -air combat in the same turn. So very simply, your MiG-23 could take an air-to-air -air shot, a BVR shot here, move here, and then attempt to engage in standard air-to-air -air combat. Now engagement in standard air-to-air -air combat is very similar. 
well, you have some additional modifiers. But since the defender also rolls for engagement, you can get different permutations of successful and unsuccessful engagements. Some can result in surprise for the attacker or disadvantage for the defender. And the defender can even choose not to engage if the defender's engagement roll succeeds and the attacker's fails. If the engagement is successful, the attacker moves into the hex and moves to the same altitude as the defender. Now maneuver is more complicated than BVR combat. First, we compare the maneuver ratings of the two flights, taking into account the altitude band of both flights and whether either flight is laden. The maneuver rating of each flight is modified by these modifiers. The difference between the two is a modifier on the maneuver table, with a positive modifier for the flight with the better adjusted maneuver rating and a negative modifier for the other flight. We also modify for the difference in the aggression value, the air-to-air -air geometry, it's better to attack from the rear, as well as these other modifiers. Surprise and disadvantage were determined during the engagement rolls. Additionally, the defender can attempt to disengage. If the defender attempts to disengage, it doesn't get any shots, but it does give the attacker a negative modifier on the maneuver table. To determine the number of shots for each flight, we roll on this table, modifying as appropriate, and cross-reference with the number of aircraft in the flight. That's the attacking flight. Remember that most Warsaw Pact aircraft use Soviet doctrine, and that's only use the one or two columns on this table. If each side gets to attempt shots, we roll for shot resolution. This is a little different than BVR combat, and that you can attempt to use an additional weapon, usually your guns, in addition to the primary weapon you're using, which is usually your IR missile. If you use an additional weapon, you get a plus one modifier in addition to the weapon's standard modifier. Depletion is the same as for BVR combat. In other well, words, in 1D10, if you're and comparing it to the depletion number, you switch to the primary and weapon the plus you fired. Modifier. Modified by minus one on your roll for each shot above the first. If the final result is one or less, and you use two weapons on the attack, then you deplete both weapons. Damage allocation is just like BVR combat, as is morale. Except with morale, the table is more unforgiving as flights are more likely to lose aggression, become disordered, or even break after a dogfight than a BVR attack. Note that in Red Storm, even flights that win the dogfight often become disordered, meaning they are effectively out of the fight, at least temporarily, and they almost always lose aggression value. For a good discussion of the original designer's opinion on air-to-air -air combat and its deleterious effect on aircraft formations and their ability to continue fighting even after an engagement, you should read the designer's notes on Wing Leader. Now, scatter is a different action and doesn't happen in BVR combat. In standard air-to-air -air combat, after the combat, you roll for each flight to see into which adjacent hex they scatter. On an odd roll, they also lose an altitude band unless they're already at deck level. Note that this can cause or permit AAA or small arms attack after the scatter if they scatter into a hex with AAA next to it or go down to the deck. Also after scatter, both flights become undetected. You also add a maneuver marker to each flight. The flight will have to spend half of its movement points rounded up to remove the maneuver marker when it next activates. Note that a flight that enters standard air-to-air -air combat ends its move. It cannot use any unspent movement points from before the combat. Finally, you roll for bailout, just as you do for BVR combat, and you mark off one fuel point. Simple enough? Then let's walk through one last example. So in this example, we have a flight of four MiG-23 MLAs at high altitude, that's the Zelenko flight, trying to jump a flight of two US Air Force F-16 Charlies, that's danger flight. Now, if you know anything about air combat, you know an F-16 is probably gonna out dogfight a MiG-23, but again, like I said, sometimes you can, even the winner of a dogfight can get taken out of the battle, can get disordered, can lose aggression. So there could be a good reason why the Warsaw Pact player would jump F-16s with his MiG-23s. Remember, we can take the BVR shot, but for this example, we're going to assume 
that either the the shot failed or Zelenko is out of BVR missiles. So he'll move one, he'll move two. You now he's at high level. We will also descend him one level because if you look at the engagement table, he gets a minus one for being at a different altitude level. So now we're gonna roll 2d10 modified by his aggression value, which is zero, and no other modifiers apply for this engagement. So Zelenko's engagement right here, 13. That is a successful engagement. Danger here has a plus one because of his engagement value, but a minus one because the target is in his rear hemisphere, so for a net of zero. And Danger also successfully engages barely. So if we look at this table, attacker yes, defender yes, commence combat, no surprise or disadvantage. Now, if Zelenko had been successful and Danger had not, he would have surprise and Danger would be disadvantaged. Um, and then also you can have Defender's choice, if the attacker fails, but defender engages, then the defender can choose whether or not there is air-to-air -air combat or standard air-to-air -air combat. First, we move Zelenko into the hex. He maintains the same hex heading as when he came into the as previous. Now we look at the maneuver table. Now an F-16 Charlie at medium altitude has a plus nine maneuver rating. The MiG-23 MLA has a plus five. Again, we modify them. None of these in the maneuver rating modifiers apply. So right now we are at plus four for the F-16 and minus four for the MiG-23 MLA. Additional modifiers. The aggression differential. The F-16 is a plus one, a Zelenko is a zero. So that takes us to a plus five, minus five. Now go to the geometry. Let's look at this geometry table. That increases one for the attacker and minus one for the defender. So that takes us from a plus five to a plus three. Neither flight is disordered. Neither flight has surprise or is disadvantaged. And neither flight is, and the enemy flight is not disengaging. So that's a plus three and a minus three. So we roll First for the MiG-23, we're going to have a minus three on this roll, only rolling on the two aircraft column because of Soviet doctrine. And a 15 down to a 12 gets us one shot. A plus three on the F-16 on dangers, a 10 up to a 13 on the two gives us two shots. So now we roll for shot resolution. So the MiG-23, if you look at his primary weapon systems, his infrared missiles are a plus one, his gun is a plus two. So he's going to elect to use his gun and then add an additional weapon for an infrared missile to make it a cumulative plus three. So a 2d10 roll, 17 plus three, takes him down to one aircraft damaged. Ironically, you can roll too high on this table. So he damaged one F-16. The F-16 table, plus three for its AIM-9 sidewinders, also gonna use this gun to make it a cumulative plus four. Remember the second weapon is a plus one no matter what it is. So two shots with a plus four. A 12 to a 16 and a 19 to a 23. So a 16 is a shot down and a 23 is a damage. So we now roll for depletion. The MiG-23 took one shot, D-10-4. We look at his gun. Now he used the gun, not the infrared missile. So it actually is less than or equal to his depletion rating of four. So on the aircraft data sheet, we would mark off his guns as depleted. The F-16 also rolls a D-10. Since he took two shots, we subtract one from our roll. So a nine modified to an eight. It is not less than or equal to his his sidewinder depletion number of three, so he is not depleted. So damage allocation. One F-16 was hit. So we look at this table, look at the two column, roll one D-10, and he shot down danger, or sorry, he damaged danger two. Now damaged aircraft can still continue to fly. 
but it cannot participate in any air-to-air -air or air-to-ground combat the rest of the battle. The F-16 has one damage and one shoot down. We roll, there are four MiG-23s, so we roll twice on the four table. We're going to roll for the shoot down first. Five, right here. So he shot down Zelenko three. Which one did he damage? Seven. That is also Zelenko three. So Zelenko three is shot down and there is no other effect. After damage allocation, we roll for morale. So we will roll for the Zelenko's morale. No discretion of value is zero. He was no, did not have surprise, did not have disadvantage. He did damage one F-16, so he gets a plus one, and then one friendly aircraft was shot down, so a, a minus one, so a cumulative zero. So 2d10 on the air-to-air -air combat table. A 16 is a jettison check, which means if he was carrying bombs, which he's not, he would check to see if they were jettisoned. For danger, his aggression value plus one. And a minus shot down, one he shot aggression. down one enemy aircraft, but he also had one damaged. So he gets a cumulative plus one. Plus one, plus one, minus one, cumulative plus one. 2d10, a 10. It's a minus one to his aggression value. And notably, he is disordered. Plus one for a modified 11. So again, the MiG-23, even though he shot down, he, one of his own aircraft was shot down, he had a good result. He shot down one of the F-16s. So next we roll for scatter. Zelenko, looking at this table, he's facing a hex side. He rolls an 8. That is one to the right. Move here. An 8 is, the, is an even number, so he does not descend a level, and he goes undetected. Now we'll roll for danger scatter. He is facing a hex spine, so we'll look at this table. Rolls a four. So that is four to the left. Here, you change his facing based upon the direction he came from. It was an even number. Had it been an odd number, we would have descended, he would have descended one level, but he doesn't. He becomes undetected. He is disordered. And they are both marked with a maneuver marker. Finally, the last step of the battle is we roll for bailout. So Zelenko lost one pilot, one through four, he is KIA, five through 10, successful bailout. So we place the parachute marker here in the hex and we mark one fuel off of both flights. And that is the end of the standard air to air combat. Now again, one MiG-23 was shot down, one F-16 was damaged. The F-16 is disordered. To recover from disorder is very difficult, so he is out of the fight at least for the short term. So in the end, one MiG-23 was shot down, one was damaged, and one F-16 was shot down. But the F-16 ended up disordered, and therefore they're out of the fight for a while. I think the encounter was a victory, but we've shown it as an example of what not to do. Now that concludes this lesson where we learned about detecting flights, tracking flights, we learned about BVR combat and air-to-air -air combat. In the next battle, we're going to learn about surface-to-air missile SAMs, and we're going to learn radar jamming. Once you understand air-to-air -air combat and SAMs in this game, you'll have grokked the majority of this game. Thanks for joining me on TC's Gaming Corner.